to discuss some of the ER procedures. Uh, maybe these kind of procedures not only specific to ER situations. You can think maybe in the clinic or in the ICU. And this is a beautiful building, right? I see that three times. Last night I visit there and uh, we have some kind of uh, interactions between Taiwan and Malaysia, just like we have another uh, beautiful building in, tai in Taipei. And also uh, in Taiwan, we will have the, uh, we hold the ASEM 2015 in Taipei, the same city where I work and where I lived. If you are enjoyed, if you are interested in this kind of event, I hope you and welcome you to visit Taiwan, Taipei, and to be with us. And then, this is my hospital. Our hospital is a, a not kind of big hospital in Taipei. In Taiwan, we have maybe 900 beds in our, in our hospital, and uh, our ER care for about 65,000 patients, ER patients in my department include surgical patients, medical patients, and pediatric patients. Some of the handouts I prepare for you is come from this uh, a very new and uh, textbook talk about emergency and critical applications in pediatric patients. I think it's quite Quite, quite good for us. If you are interested and try to find some reference book, I recommend these books. I have no conflict of interest with this book, all right? And I bought the uh, electronic font, Kindle font. And to scan for the pediatric patients, sometimes we think we try to prepare the environment to get better image. When you scan the ultras, you, you use the ultrasound, you will turn the light, turn off the light and to create a darker environment to get better uh, image. But for the pediatric patients, it's that kind of easy, comfortable situations. You have to think about that. So try to have uh, family caregivers be accompanied and sometimes you need to turn on the light and to create a better situations. And most of the time, I scanned in uh, ER and in ICU, most of my scanning, I do not turn off the light. I use this kind of uh, lightening environment to do the scan. Only if I need to get a picture or a detailed information, I turn off the light. That kind of uh, consideration should be uh, important for pediatric patients. For the musculoskeletal in, uh, information, I highlight this kind of uh, structures. Because when you apply the ultrasound, you have to know what are you looking at, especially for the musculoskeleton. If you are not familiar with that kind of ultrasound patterns, you don't know what you are looking at. For the easiest part is, you can see this kind of black is created window by stand of pad or use copious chairs, you can create that kind of window to see the superficial part. This is dermis and dermis, that's bright, hyperechoic. The other layer, deeper layer, a smooth layer, also bright, hyperechoic is fascia. And the deeper is bone. When you are confusing, you can rotate the probe and to see the bone. Because when you parallel to the bone, and it appears bright line, but you, when you intersect transview of the bone, it will create a bright surface and acoustic shadow that you have your landmark. Then, skin, fascia, and bone. You know what you are looking at. Then, the tissues uh, in between, just like here, we have a <coughs> black and uh, white lines, that's cutaneous labor, and then the muscles. The muscles depends on what you are looking at. If you look on a perlite, it looks like the striated appearance. If you uh, scan on the short axis of the muscle, it will appear speckle-like appearance. That's the brief introduction. 
If you got better equipment, just like this one, linear probe with adequate frequency, then you have great tool. But if you don't have that kind of tool, you got limited resources, you got limited equipment, you only have curved linear probe, that does not mean you cannot apply the ultrasound. When you use the ultrasound to scan for the muscular skeleton, you can compare to the other side. That's the interesting part. When you see right arm, I don't know what I'm looking at, is that pathology. You can compare to the other side to define the label and the patterns. And try to find out some windows if you don't have good equipment, just like this. You can use a lot of gels. That's your window. You create a window, you can get better resolution. This kind is also created window. This image is cried by curvilinear abdominal probe to scan for the finger. Can you figure out that? You can create by IV bag. Better window, right? So you can see the skin of the finger and the bone and even the extensor tendon. So if you are trying to figure out foreign body or something like that, you can create that kind of window. If the skin is intact, you can even immerse the uh, maybe hands, feet into water tank or something like that and directly scan inside. That's also the window. Or you can use it a cheaper way. Use the latex glove to fill it with the water. Acceptable, right? The same, use curved linear prop to skin for the finger. Because sometimes we were trying to figure out that kind of spasmal abscess or foreign body inside. And try to use your machine smart. Zuni, you can enlarge. Most of the machine has that kind of function. You can zoom in to create a better and bigger image too. You can see. We can do it in the real time, in mobile way. And then, after we introduce some kind of ultrasound images of the muscular patients, we were trying to introduce some kind of pathology. This kind of pathology we call the cobblestone appearance. Why this cobblestone appearance? Just like when I introduced the subcutaneous, uh, subcutaneous tissues composed of fat and the interpose the connective tissue. The fat will appear darker on normal situation. The connective tissue will become brighter. When it got inflammation, the ultrasound pattern is not specific, but indicate inflammation. It demands change. The fluid will dis the, the fluid will spread across the along the connective tissue. So that will become darker. The fat, when it got inflammation or got injury, the echogenicity will increase, become brighter. So the cobblestone appearance <coughs> will be created, just like this. Cobblestone appearance. Normally, the fat should look darker. And the connective <coughs> tissues should become brighter when it got inflammation, change to cobblestone appearance. So you can see this kind of pattern, that kind of uh, pattern may be related to cellulitis. But cellulitis, we do not scan for the cellulitis all the time. That's kind of clinical diagnosis. If you use ultrasound to scan all the things, that means you are not so good, right? <laughs> but ultrasound can be used to scan for this kind of situation. Rate more tense and hurt. Is there any access within that that space? That what we are thinking about. This is the right side lesion. We make think the carbuncle or abscess. This is ultrasound scanning. We can see no collection inside. So the soft tissue from the normal side to injury side, we can see the normal side. And when I put the probe to the injury side, the the most redny slide, this area becomes large and even brighter. Not so typical, because it is scanned by the pocket ultrasound, put in my pocket only. So the resolution is not bad, uh, the same as the previous image.
Ultrasound can be used to distinguish for those abscesses, cobblestone appearance. If you encounter this kind, you know the treatment and disposition should be different from the standard way to treat cellulitis. How does the abscess look like? Varies. Why? Because like this, this image, we can see uh, just at the spine, paraspinal area. A lot of echogenic particles, brighter, and some of them darker, and even some of this is a spinous process, and even some of the content looks like bright and with dirty shed, that means air. So that's kind of abscess. So variable content create barriers, variable ultrasound image. How to determine that is mass or the abscess? You can use the ultrasound to compress, to try to create some mobile movement, just like this way. This is abscess, and we can try to put the probe and try to create some mobile movement, just like this way. Abscess and air content. Working in the ER, when you prepare something, you always encounter something. Just when I prepare this, can you see this image required time and date? Just two days earlier, <laughs> right? Real case. A nine years old girl got neck pain and sweating for maybe about two to three weeks from the initial pain to swallow. What can ultrasound do? Can you see the mark? The mark site is the cricothyroid member. So the trachea deviated to the right side, very obviously. So we scan the ultrasound here. This is the squeeze sign. So it's kind of abscess at the neck. So then the next video scan from here, transversely to right side. You can see the trachea is here. And then transversely scan through here and we can see how big the, the abscess is. Despite she does not have any signs of airway compromise right now, but we need to prepare. That's why I scan here for the cricoid cartilage and thyroid cartilage, cricothyroid membrane to do the mark in case if we need to prepare for the crushed airway, we got prepared. So I got the mark. And then, sometimes you see something in the soft tissue. You cannot distinguish from the abscess. You can use Doppler to define if that is any reason, lymph node or abscess, just like here. We can see the inguinal area. This is femoral artery and vein. We can see a small a block, a black uh, node, node here. Got some uh, vascular images inside. So. This is a lymph node instead of abscess. And for the most severe kind of soft tissue infections comes from uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, most most uh, uh, literature and text papers does not cover much about the ultrasound appearance on the necrotizing fasciitis. This is from my colleagues from National Taiwan University Hospital. They found that they experienced, despite that the small case numbers, but they find that if you can scan the cellulitis patterns and found that the fluid just around the fascia, the thickness is greater than four millimeters. You should be careful about that. That means some kind of fasciitis. If the patient's conditions correlate, you should be aware that that patient's may have 90% accuracy to be necrotizing fasciitis. Just be careful. And this is not a pediatric patient, but uh, all of you may be familiar with this kind of uh, emergency, phonase gangrene. Sometimes the fasciitis got fluid separated inside. Sometimes we get got the gas, just like here. This is a gas bed, dirty, bright with dirty shadows. So ultrasound is interesting. You see this kind of patterns inside the, uh, near the uh, perineum or squatter area, you know that's kind of phonian gangrene. 
If you see this kind of patterns inside the liver, what's your diagnosis? Gastronomic liver abscess, similar situations. So if we do not see the fascia fluid, right? But this is also some kind of severe soft tissue infection. So sometimes you can see uh, fluid accumulates greater than four millimeters around the fascia, including fasciitis. Sometimes you see the gas dispersed within it. It's also some kind of necrotizing fasciitis. And then the next topic I will cover is joint diffusion. I think that's quite important, especially many joints you can scan. But for the you, you can see the bone, then the ligament, uh, some kind of structure here. So you need to identify your landmark. The landmark is bone. Bone is easier. Bright surface, acoustic shadow. So you got your landmark. For the knee part, you especially need to focus on the patella bursa. If you see the fluid at that bursa, that always means some kind of interactions connection into the intraarticular surfaces. We can use ultrasound to locate, diagnose, and even assess the puncture. Even uh, you can use it to identify the location, static way or real-time way. For the pediatric patients, if you see the fluid around, around the neck, greater the thickness is greater than 5 millimeters, that means joint effusions. If you compare to the other side, the difference is, is greater than two millimeters, that means joint effusions. How to scan? It's just like these, these babies. We keep, create a frog position, and we scan. Uh, you can use your probe oriented toward the umbilicus and to align with the femoral bone. This is my daughter, as a not diffusion as a model, okay? So I pay her for this model. <laughs> so you see the the femoral head and the neck and then no fluid. If the fluid is around here, this kind of sub tissue with this place. This is a true patient, but not a pediatric patient, but I think it's similar. Transverse way we can see some kind of maybe hypo and echoic or even hyper echoic around the bone. This is a bone. Transverse, we can identify important structures. And this is the joint diffusion. So when you scan, especially at the, at, at the hip level, you need to identify the femoral triangle. Otherwise, if you puncture it, and you may injure this important structure. You can compare, just when I mentioned, you can create a dual image, the lesion side and the normal side of the image is quite clear. And you can use a static way, localized, to scan. This patient's got some kind of instrument, so it's difficult to define. And we also got scan the, the painful hip side. We can see uh, increased fluid around this is the right side and this is the left side. So we can see some kind of fluid around that joint because this patient's got fever, hip pain, and leukocytosis. We got to determine is that kind of inflammation, infections around the processes. Because if that is the situation, it's a kind of different management. So we localize it. As you can see, no probe here. So we do it in a static way too identify the depths. So I use the spinal needle instead of normal syringe, syringe needles. We can also scan in real time. What is real time? It is a joint effusion scanning. We can see <coughs> fluid around. That's bone, right? Bright surface and acoustic shadow. So we got joint effusion at the elbow level. We can do it real time. Ultrasound guided, put the needle in and do the aspiration. And when we do the aspiration, you can see the fluid amount decrease, needle and aspiration movement. And then after our treatment, you can see the fluid amount is dramatically decreased, the pain is reduced and the movement regain. Also elbow sweating. 
initial scanning, we think that kind of apps is inside, so we, we consult the surgeon. But the surgeon is not available right now because they are operating into another patient. I, to, uh, luckily, I got the ultrasound. So I do the real time. You can see the needle puncture. The needle and the angling will create different kind of image. When our needling become flat, the needle is getting better image. So we get the aspiration. Result is not abscess, it's necrosis fat. Some kind of injury got the fat necrosis. So we aspirate it and we can diagnose, guide the puncture and to see the increment. So the patient is discharged immediately because no abscess and the result is good. Then ultrasound can use to identify foreign bodies. Because we when we work in pediatric department or in surgical department or ER, we worry about foreign body because uh, according to the literature, maybe nearly 40% of foreign body situations got missed on first index visit. So if you can ultrasound to identify that kind of foreign body, you can change your management. The, what is foreign body looks like depends on the size, materials, inside, and the durations. So it got a variable uh, ultrasound pattern. Most of that patterns should look like brighter, hyper, hyper echoic pattern. Uh, have shadow or no, no, don't, doesn't have shadow, depends on the size. The bigger size may have a prominent shadow. If the foreign body retain for more than 24 hours, tissue inflammation will create some kind of edematous change around that, so we will have a hollow effect. Ultrasound is useful for radio loosened foreign body. If that's kind of radioed a pack, you just send to the X-ray and return. That's easy, right? Save the time. But for the radio loosened foreign body, or you try to locate it, manage it by your way, you can use the ultrasound. You, ultrasound can use to identify to needle it. You can use your needle under real-time situation and to approach the foreign body and do the cutting and remove that. Otherwise, if you got experience, when you find the foreign body, you cut the skin, cut the soft tissue, and everything makes because you don't have the field. So the needle is your guide to locate, to facilitate you to find this kind of things. You can see these uh, images from the textbook. Swelling, suspect some splinting, splinter inside, x-ray, very loosened. Ultrasound, you can see the structures here and remove time matters, initial pattern, and after maybe 24 hours, hollow effect, tissue inflammation around that. Again, if you don't have good uh, equipment, these two image created by Kevin yeah, don't no problem. To scan where? To scan your big toy here, near here. We scan for the needle. This is use copious gel. As you can see, the needle here. And when we change to the other side, a small ring down artifact here, bright echo with some kind of uh, maybe coming tails on something like that. Here we use a uh, IV bag to create a better image here. <coughs> and again, this kind of fish fin, what, what is fish fin? This man work in the market to deal with the fish got punctured inside the, the, the finger, got swelling. He just came to ER for the wound management only. I have the ultrasound, so I scan for some, some kind of materials and actually find these things. Can you see this tiny, tiny, tiny? I enlarge that on the initial side, I can identify that. But you see, the patient comes in, not to the x-ray, comes in and I, I ask him to put the fingers on the table and scan that and to tell that you got foreign body inside. You ready? Take the x-ray. He can convince the body. 
this. This is a skin copy of child and to put the pocket size ultrasound here, we can see the bone <coughs> skin and this is a, a abnormal finding. It should not appear here. Longitudinal weight and transverse weight. Sometimes you need to identify a pathology, a problem in two ways. Because in one way you can see, in the other way you can not see. Sometimes it is artifact, not true pathology. Then we will talk about the, the other hyperechoic structure bone. This is the sternum bone, sternum bone surface. This is the bone surface. As you can see, when we scan for the bone, the bone will have a bright surface and some kind of caustic shadow. The cortex should appear bright and continuous without interruption and no hematoma around. And then we can see this image to get your better identification. This is the fourth metatarsal bone. <coughs> the bone and the joint space and clear surface for these trauma patients got head pain. When we scan for the fifth uh, metatarsal bone, you can see the bony fragment. The cortex interruption got fragment, got some kind of a black fluid around. Right? Hematoma. So we can use different kind of criteria to identify the fracture. Cortical interruption, fragment, and hematoma to identify the fragment. In this case, we can see two uh, indications integrated into each other. The femoral bone, smooth surface, and the joint space is clear. And uh, so And from the above, we can see from the left side, the femoral head, the femoral shaft, got femoral neck fracture because the light is interrupted and some kind of blood around here. See? Blood can appear bright instead of black. This kind of fresh blood. And then, when you are interested in using ultrasound to scan for the fracture, you have to be aware of something especially in pediatric patients, just like this kind of incomplete fracture. When we scan on this side, when we scan this side, fracture side, you can see the disruption. It's easy. But when you scan from this side, the smooth cortical line, and then when we scan from the other ways, smooth then to fracture side. So if you are using ultrasound to scan for the long bone fractures, remember to scan different way, especially for those kind of incomplete fractures. Beautiful leg. Have you visited leg? Not yet. Try to visit leg. I visit leg and uh, run two circles to less less nine. Okay. Then the next topic, because sometimes we need some break there, right? And then the lumbar punctures. Just uh, when the doctor uh, just told that, we, most of the time we do not do the lumbar puncture in real time. We used to locate, identify. For those kind of difficult patients, those landmarks are not clear. If the landmark is clear, why do you use ultrasound to, to make your no comparison, right? So you can scan in the midline or uh, power media. This is articular process, the bone, and this you can see the intervertebral disc space, the sacrum. So you can count different areas. Longitudinal to define the intervertebral space and to scan vertebrally, vertically, transversely and vertically to do two kind of landmark to find your target. This is the spinal process, a uh, bright surface with a caustic shadow. Let's look at this video. You can scan from the transverse way to identify the spinal process and to move and to try to figure the space to in between. The transducer is placed in a transverse direction. <coughs> Transversely to find the, the patient's left side in the middle of the back and then the level of the iliac crest. The spinous process processes will appear as distinct hyperechoic peaks with acoustic shadowing below and define the midline <coughs> of the spine. You can scan 
from the first encounter path and then to move up or lower to identify the other target and then rotate to create a longitudinal way. The spinous forces, this is your space, and you can try to puncture inside. For adults, for those with obesity, you can, it's difficult to find the deeper and depth of the structure, but you know where to put inside the needle. For the pediatric, that's quite kind of interesting, especially for those smaller, smaller ones. You can scan all the structures without interruption. Can you see the spine? Can you see the spinal cord, cord equina, and even the spaces? It is easier to identify, especially for those smaller kids. So you can define where is the dif uh, difficult and the challenging places. And if you scan in transverse way, you can even see the nerve root oscillated with the baby's respiration and heart rate. Can you see the nerve, nerve root os oscillation? For those smaller ones, you can use linear ult ult ultrasound to scan those kind of images. And uh, the body position is quite important. This video also comes from my daughter, model, and I asked her to do a positional change from standing to bend her body. As we can see, spinal forces, when she bends, the intervertebral space got widening. More flexion of the neck does not create better better or widening, widening as, uh, space. When the space widening, you can see the deeper structures, spinal condyle. So you can identify the depth. And then the last topic I covered about a new and emerging applications. Even now, I am trying to learn myself needling. So you can see this is a phantom. So if you are interested in pain management, try to try to relieve some kind of pain. You should do some kind of practice. You can use the phantom for the vessel, for the nerve. Approach not to ins to the nerve, right? So you need to practice, because this kind of practice needs you know, cognitive skill. You need to practice. No one can read the video and learn everything. It's impossible. You are God, and I'm not. So it's, it's a practice. So when your practice is okay, you can put your needle into everywhere, surface, around, and beneath. Then you can try to learn the nerve neurology. So this is ulnar nerve, right? ulnar nerve and uh, ulnar nerve and ulnar artery. The transverse way, this is ulnar nerve. Ulnar artery, this is ulnar nerve. What does nerve look like? Honeycomb. In a transverse way, just like a honeycomb way. So, radio artery to radio side is a little bit difficult to scan. Radio, uh, radio nerve to radio side of the radio artery is easier. And then the median nerve, you can scan from the middle and to the proximal. It will become easier to identify. And then, this kind of applications, we scan the femoral nerve, artery, and femoral band, uh, the femoral triangle. So if the patient's got a femoral neck, femoral shaft fractures, maybe we can use that kind of applications to release the pain if the operation and some kind of management should be delayed. So we have to familiar with this kind of uh, anatomy. When we do the vascular axis, our target is this area. But if we are doing the nerve block, you just need to move a little bit laterally. So you can see for this patient's got intertrochanteric fractures, if we want to do <coughs> provide more better, better pain relief, we can scan the tri near, uh, triangle. And this is the femoral nerve. Also, you can identify it and got the punctures. That's kind of topic I just uh, cover a little bit. Use this kind of ultrasound, you can put the needle in it and provide some three-in-one nerve block for the femoral nerve, obturator nerve, the cutaneous nerve. So, 
sorry for the delay because I got I got a little time to 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 deliver a lot of topics, right? So any questions for me right now? Okay, so get a brief take home message and summary. For the soft tissue infections, use the ultrasound smartly to scan for those uh, maybe a cold, not to identify the abscess. That's your first target. And for the joint diffusions, find the landmark. Your landmark is the bone and to scan around. And then for the foreign bodies, radio loose and foreign bodies your target. After you're familiarized with the structures and <coughs> you it'll be easier to identify the foreign body. For the fractures, try to find out the cortical disruption hematoma fragment and don't forget to scan in different way, especially for the pediatric patients. Lumbar puncture to identify the spinous forces and neck. Thank you.